<laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to church. Welcome to everyone watching online. Get rolling here in a second. If you need sermon notes or pens, just raise your hand. Or if you're watching online, there are notes in the feed. So we are in part eight of our series, and um, we're in Colossians, and today we're going to talk about um, if you're going to a dance at the gates of hell, what should I wear? So that's going to be the title of our sermon. Well, I'll, I'll explain it, and I'll show you how I came up with this one. Um, but here's the thing about sermons when you're thinking about them. I, I simply observe life. That's just kind of what I do when I'm doing sermons. And uh, I heard this years ago, and one guy said this. He said, all of life illustrates Bible doctrine. And that makes sense to me. I kind of understand that. I kind of think everything through this biblical lens. So it's kind of odd. But um, I'll look at different things, and I'll think, wow, that'll preach. Well, a couple of uh, weeks ago... Um, I got a message from some of my old Madison friends, and they had a 40-year hockey championship reunion. I didn't even remember the championship that we won, but they invited me to this, uh, to this get-together, and it was last night, which was, uh, I'll talk a little bit about it, it was an absolute blast. Uh, but do you know they actually have apps that tell you what to wear? Did you guys know that? Anybody know that? Yeah, and, but... Um, by the way, um, they don't tell you what to wear to a hockey reunion, just so you know, because I looked. But here's what we're going to do today. With all that said, we're going to talk about what to wear because the text kind of dictates that. And we'll do that by talking about Bruce Lee, of course, uh, the God called Pan and Abraham Lincoln. And then what we're going to do also is we will storm the gates of hell. You guys good with that? So that's where we're going to go today. So I'm thinking about this sermon, thinking about what to put on, because that's the text. The text is what to wear. Um, how to act, um, what to prepare yourself to. And so that's what I was going after. Um, and so I'm going to take this back, first of all, to Jesus, and then we'll connect the dots. But Jesus has his students, his disciples, they're called Talmudin, and he teaches them in a very hands-on way. So he takes them to a place called Caesarea Philippi. And you can see it on the map. I just kind of put it in red there. And you can see this is where all the tension in the world is right now, where wars are going on, and you see all this stuff that's happening. But this place that he took them to is also called um, the Gates of Hell. Now, there was caves there, and there was a big, huge waterfall, um, and that's, uh, that's why, what they called the Gates of Hell. And here's a picture of what it looks like there. And so you have this particular area, and this was called the Grotto of Pan. Now, when you're talking about Pan, Pan is a particular god, and so what they do is they worship this particular god amongst other gods in the middle of this situation. And so what they thought was they thought that this god Pan and other gods in this area, this was their gateway, and you'll see a picture here. This was their gateway into the other world. So they thought these gods went back and forth into hell and then came back. That's where they came up with the um, idea of that whole thing, and that's why they called it the gates of hell. So Jesus has his followers, they're connected together, and he begins to tell them things like, hey, if you're going to follow me, you're going to have to deny yourself. If you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you. And he's challenging their faith, and he's preparing them for what goes on. Now, this place that he's taking them to is a place where it is kind of the center of fertility worship. And this worshiping of Pan um, made things fertile and things grew. But there was a guy named Alexander the Great and his Greek army. And what they would do, they made this place famous uh, because what they would do is they would come there and they would have super weird erotic parties. But that was part of what went on in that particular area. So they had goat pens and they would have weird things, and this was so offensive to Torah-following Jewish people. And so Jesus takes them right into this area that is called the center of evil. And so he takes them there, and he's talking with his guys, and he's talking about who do other people say that I am, and they're having this conversation. And then he looks at his group, and he says this, but who, what about you? Who do you say that I am. And so Peter answers the question. 
He says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And listen to Jesus, his response. It's Matthew 16, 17, and 18. He says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And then he goes on to say this, and I tell you, you are Peter. And upon this rock, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell or the gates of Haiti will not overcome it. So this is a really important text of scripture because he talks about how the church is going to be built. What is the church built on? And there are three different interpretations here on what it's built on. The first interpretation is Peter was the first pope. The second interpretation of this is what's called the revelation, and that's why I emphasized this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but it was revealed to you by my Father who is in heaven. And the third, and I think this kind of fits into both, um, this rock where there's gods and there's evil, I'm going to build my church in the midst of evil. And there's always going to be something that comes against my church, but the gates of Hades or the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, ultimately, I'm going to just give you the proper explanation of this and the proper understanding of it. Here's the understanding of it. It's about revelation. The church of Jesus Christ is built on the revelation of Jesus Christ as the Son of God and the Savior of the world. Now, here's what's interesting about that. That is not revealed to us by flesh and blood. It's a revelation that comes from God to each and every person. You guys tracking with me there? This is not about a church building. This is about the unity of the church from every denomination, Christian denomination, and we all believe together. And that's where the church is built upon. And so that's my interpretation of it, which is the proper one, by the way. So <laughs> just so you know, we're you know fixing 2,000 years of church history there. Um, but he used this as a background drop And here's what he's emphasizing. He's like, listen, life is going to be really tough at times. You simply have to press on. Can I get an amen? That's just true for all of us. And that is what he's preparing them for. Now, we're going to move forward. Paul, he gets the most pronounced revelation in the Bible. And what happens to Paul is he's riding on his horse. He gets knocked off of his horse. And Jesus appears to him in a vision. And he has this incredible revelation of Jesus Christ. And so it changes his life. He moves on and this is where he starts preaching the gospel. He understands the gospel in a new way. He has incredible uh, revelation. And what Paul wants, his goal is for other people, for every single person to have this revelation through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's why he continues to preach. And so he goes in this area, he gets thrown in prison, and he writes the letter to the Colossians from prison. And he explains what he wants, and he has a gold in the middle of it. And you can see it in the second chapter of Colossians. Let's read this together. My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love, so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ. And that's his goal. He wants people to know Jesus. Now, the natural inclination, as it says in notes, if you want to fill it out, in all religion is toward rules. Paul continues to point his readers to Jesus. Now, he's going to give guidelines here today, and we're going to look at all those things, but all those guidelines come from who Jesus is. This is what separates Christianity from every other religion in the world, that the God that we serve comes and lives in us. That is the difference between Christianity and every other religion. It's the message of the grace of God given to sinners and sufferers, which are you and I. So Paul just, he goes, he goes, what he does is he goes through these um, passages that we're going to read, and we're looking at kind of the whole third chapter, but he gives what's called imperatives, and his imperatives are kind of directives on what to do, but he doesn't do that until he tells you who you are. When you know who you are, then you'll know 
what to do. And so Paul's brilliant in how he does this and how he writes. If you guys would stand with me, we're going to read the first four verses, and then we'll jump to the 12th and the 15th, and then, and then I'll fill in the rest of them as, um, as we kind of go into this. So let's just read this together. Since then, you've been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is not hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. So he begins to talk about this in, in greater detail. And then we're going to jump down to the 12th through the 15th verses, and then we'll read more. Um, let me find that. And there we go. Therefore... As God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with one another and forgive one another. If any of you has a, guy, a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love let, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. So you guys can be seated. Let's fill this in. So if we're looking at how to prep to go to a party at the gates of hell, here's what we're going to do first. We're going to look at what to shop for. What do I shop for? In Colossians, in Colossians 3, 1 and 2, Here's what he says. He says, since then, you have been raised with Christ. Underline these words if you're taking notes. Set your hearts. Just underline that. And he goes, on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Um, and then he says, and you can underline this as well, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. And so he's kind of, kind of given a contrast here. Um, for me personally, not a big shopper. There are two things I like to shop for, groceries and tennis shoes. Those are the things that I enjoy shopping for. I, other than that, um, you know, I don't like shopping at all. But what Paul's doing, he's giving his readers something to think about, something to look at, basically something to shop for. And he's saying there are many, many, many things you can choose from, and you have so many choices, but he says, I'm going to narrow it down. He's going to narrow the... He's going to narrow it down to two, two choices. So in your notes, Paul simplified choices. The first one is eternal. And then we're going to just look at what is eternal. So that's the first one. You can fill that in. And here's what's eternal. What's eternal is my relationship with Jesus. That is the number one thing. So when he says, set your minds in context... Um, he's talking about understanding who you are. He's, he's referring to what he previously wrote, where he wrote who you are. He wrote all of these things. And what he is telling these guys is, listen, don't let anyone sway you from an empty philosophy, from an earthly philosophy. He said, set your mind on things above. He says, um, he's talking about the benefits of the gospel. And then he lays it out even further. We saw in the 12th verse, he's talking about love, joy, peace, and patience, and goodness, and all these things that are the fruit of the Spirit. Now, the first thing is my relationship with Jesus. The second thing to think about, or another thing that is eternal, are people. People matter to God. That's the number one thing. People matter to God. I went to this, um, to this uh, hockey get-together last night, and... It was all my old Madison guys. And so I always talk about how difficult Madison was, but I've forgotten how great of a community of people that that place was when we were growing up. And all of those guys, they were just telling story after story of when we grew up. You know, you had to be home by the 9 o'clock whistle. Did anybody have the 9 o'clock whistle? Or when the street lights were on, that's when you had to be home. But we were out all day. There were no cell phones. And we played sports from morning until night. And so it was just really fun to see that group of people. And I've went to several different ones. I went to a, we were a softball thing um, in St. Louis where we were inducted into the uh, softball hall of fame. Not a big deal. It sounds like a big deal. It's really not. But it was just a different community of people because that was more business. Um, and 
the thing about the people that I was with last night, it was more community. And it was just really fun, fun stories to listen to. And here's the next one. The next one, it's my relationship with people, or my relationship with Jesus is people. And the third one is God. Um, in a speech made in 1863, here's what Abraham Lincoln said. He said, we have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no other nation has ever grown. And this is in 1863, and here's what he says. But we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. And we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. Intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient sufficient to feel the necessary of redeeming and preserving grace, too proud to pray to the God that made us. 1863, 2024. Can I get an amen? And we're looking at this as America. We're looking at this as a nation, I'll tell you, as the world. And we see some of the craziness that's going on in the world right now. And I'm going to tell you my position on this and where it started. I mean, it started way back when. But the big thing that happened to our culture is there was a, 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 a court case. It was Engel versus Vital in eight, uh, 1962 when they took prayer out of the classrooms. And this is where we're at today because of that. And so um, I think as a country, and, and I'm afraid that's true, but I'm going to tell you something. As Christ followers, we haven't forgotten God. Can I get an amen? amen? Because we're into that. We're into the Lord, and the Lord has really done us grace. The second thing, the first one's uh, uh, eternal. The second one is temporary. And he's talking about the earthly distractions that come our way. Um, and listen, God is not opposed for us to enjoying our life. He gave us these things to enjoy. Um, and he's referring to different teachings and he's in context. Remember, he's fighting against, and I've talked about this each time we've, we've talked this, um, this letter, he's fighting against something called syncretism. And syncretism is bringing other areas or other religions in and adding it to the gospel. And so he's making, he's talking about things of earth, and he's making it both personal and relation, uh, relational. And here's what I mean. The question is this, is there anything that if you had to think about if you had to think about it, is there anything that you don't have that would really make you happy? And then you think, if I get this, I'm going to really be happy. And here's the thing about earthly successes. They're only, they only last for a minute. Once you get them, you think that this was the thing that's going to make me happy. And then you find out that it doesn't. And then you'll go on to the next thing. Um, and that's where idols come in. We begin to look at different things as idols. Let me give you the second thing in your notes. He talks about then what to throw away. And these are verses I'm going to introduce you to these verses. But he talks about what to throw away. And in the fifth verse, we didn't read it, but I'm going to read it right now. He says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your early nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. So you see, he points them in a particular, uh, particular direction. The NAS, NASB puts it this way. Let's read this one together. Therefore, treats the part of your earthly body as dead to sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to, adult, to a, adultery. And so he's talking about you have to throw some particular things away. I know for me, I have some favorite clothes. Um, I had some jeans that I would duct tape together and my wife didn't like that. So she got rid of those. I was looking for a shirt one day. I told you guys this before. Some of you haven't heard the story, but I was looking for a shirt and I'm like, ah, where is that? Where's that sweatshirt? Because I cut my sweatshirts because that's what I do. And I'm looking everywhere for the sweatshirt. And then Jen shows me a video um, of people in Haiti, and someone in Haiti was wearing my sweatshirt. <laughs> Hand to God, wearing my sweatshirt. I'm like, I, 
how did they get that? How did you even get that there? That was my question. And so she put my clothes to death. She put them away. So now listen to this verse. So he goes on to say this, for it is because of these things that the wrath of God is coming up on the sons of disobedience. And in them, you also once walked when you were living in them. Now, when you, if you take a verse out of context and you look at that verse and you say, oh, he said that there are parts of, 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 of our earthly body and we're supposed to treat these things as dead. Impurity, passion, sexual immorality, evil desire, greed. We've all walked in these things before. We have. I mean, that's just simply that you're, that's part of being human. And he says, now the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, meaning daughters as well. Let me explain something to you. You're not, as a Christian, you're not the son and daughter of disobedience. You're the son and daughter of Jesus. You're in this family of God. He's just warning um, what he's warning of what goes on now. It doesn't mean that we even still struggle with these things. What he's saying is, he's saying these are issues of the heart. And he's really just saying this. If you look at the whole context of the letter, he's saying this is not who you are. In Christ, this is not who you are. This is who you used to be. And if you're going to walk in Christ with who you are, this is how you walk. And he said this, and in them, you also once walked when you were living with them. And so he's saying, these things got to go. You treat these things as dead. And this really comes down to, this is a not who I am issue. I'm not that person anymore. That's I hesitate to go to a 40 year hockey reunion because the truth is I'm not that person anymore. I'm not the person that was BC back then. That was before Christ. And so um, I'm not that same person, and it, you know, I'm here. And it was beautiful because a lot of the people that I was with, they, they aren't the same people as well. So it's really cool to see. So this is why this is such an issue. Um, when you do something like this, when you walk in impurity or evil desire, um, when you walk against your nature, you're doing this against who you actually are. And so you're fighting against your natural instinct. You can't make a dog meow. Dogs bark because that's their natural instinct. Our natural instinct is we are dead to sin. Now, we'll struggle with the flesh, but in Christ, we're dead to sin. And let me explain something. This is probably a little controversial. You probably may have not have heard this before. Um, the first thing to remember is in Christ, we're righteous before God, okay? But here's the statement that's controversial. If your sins are forgiven eternally, um, why am I worried about this? But here's the other thought. The other thought is this. You will have consequences for your earthly sin. Does that make sense? Our sins are forgiven. And here's what you have to remember. We look at people and we think, oh, look at what they did. And they call themselves a Christian. And they did this particular sin, or they're living this particular way. But guess what? Think about the things that we struggle with. That doesn't disqualify us from the kingdom of God. But it, what, it, what it does, if we walk in a particular way, if we walk in particular sins that we were gr grasping onto and holding onto, it makes us completely miserable. Does that make sense? That's the earthly consequences. And there are other consequences of sin, and they make you miserable. God's designed us to walk in a particular way. And that's why he uses the word idolatry. These aren't who you are. You're after a different God. And so he shows how it works. And so he's, he, he, Paul also talks about the desires that we have. And he says that there's, a, there's one guy that wrote, I think it was Augustine, he said there's a God-shaped hole in your heart that only God can fill. But along our journey, there will be things that woo us away from God. Um, number three in your notes, what to take off. And here's what he says here. He says, but now 
you must rid yourself of all such things as these. So if you look, man, he goes through a whole list of things. He continues to add on to these things. Let's read it. But now you must also rid yourself of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. And it all starts with anger. That's where it comes from. And he's just talking about the struggle that we'll have in the flesh. Um, One day, a man was walking along a beach, and he tripped over a lamp. He turned around, and he kicked the lamp out of anger. A few seconds later, a genie popped out of the lamp, but the genie was angry that the man had kicked his lamp. Reluctantly, the genie said, even though you kicked me, I still have to give you three wishes. However, because of what you did, I will also give twice of what you wish for to the person that you hate the most, your boss. So the man agreed and made his first wish. I want lots of money, he said, and instantly $22 million appeared in the man's bank account. And 44, appear, 44 million appeared in, into his boss's account. For a second wish, the man wished for a couple of sports cars. Instantly, a Lamborghini and a uh, Ferrari appeared. But at the same time, out of, outside of his boss's home appeared two of each car. Finally, the genie said, this is your last wish. You should choose carefully. And so the man thought for a long period of, re, uh, for a long period of time, and then he replied this. I've always wanted to donate one kidney. (laughs) Takes a second. So Paul's writing about something we would discover in the study of our brain. Anger can become an addiction. Anger is more addicting than drugs. If you've ever been around an angry person, you'll see this. It's just crazy. You're walking on eggshells because you have this crazy behavior. Now, Paul goes on to say this. He says, do not lie to one another. Since you stripped off the old self with its evil practices, read this last part with me, and have put on the new self. And we talked about being a new creation. That's what he's talking about here, which is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created it. And this goes back to God shaping us to be more and more like Christ. And so this is an inside out game. It's not through trying harder that you get better. It's through trusting in what Jesus has done. In James 3, 5, and 6, he talks about the language. He says, let's read this whole text together. It's kind of long, but let's read it. A bit in the mouth of a horse controls the whole horse. A small rudder on a ship in the hands of a skilled captain sets a course in the face of the strongest winds. A word out of your mouth may seem of no account, but it can accomplish nearly anything or destroy it. It only takes a spark, remember, to set off a forest fire. A careless or wrongly paced word out of your mouth can do that. And so how do I fix that, right? Because sometimes, you know, as a communicator, I talk a lot and sort of things that that come out of my mouth that shouldn't at times. And so sometimes you just have to say to yourself, hey, listen, I'm not going to say that. I'm just, God gave me a will and I'm simply not going to say that. But man, it is really, really difficult. There's a story in the fifth chapter chapter of the book of Luke. And there's a guy who is paralyzed. And his friends, they wanted to get him healed. And there were too, there was too many people uh, crowding around Jesus, so they cut a hole in the roof and they lower him down, and the crowd stops, and everyone sees what's happening. And then here's what Jesus does. The first thing he does, he goes, man, your sins are forgiven. The first thing he says, your sins are forgiven. And they were, the people that were listening, the religious people, were completely furious at, at the whole idea. But here's the, the point I want to make. At the core... At our core, we need forgiveness. And once we get it, everything else flows from that. Understanding that we're forgiven really does make a difference. And I'm going to talk about forgiveness next week. I'm going to talk about how we forgive and what that, what that looks like. Um, let me give you the last one. The last one is what do we actually wear? What do we put on? So he, now he turns it back around to the identity issue. And here's what he says. Therefore, as God's chosen people, and here's where he gives us our identity, holy and dearly loved. That's brilliant 
in how he writes. And then he says this, clothe, your, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. When uh, my son was doing, he's got a podcast, he was doing a podcast the other day, and he was talking about growing up in our, in our home. And he said, my dad used to make us watch Bruce Lee movies as kids. And I'm like, yeah, doesn't everyone? I mean, isn't that good parenting? You're in a war. This, this life is a battle. You've got to learn how to fight. So that's my theory. And, so, and Bruce Lee really wore some cool stuff. If you look at this picture, it really wore some cool stuff, right? And so I have a grandson. He can't watch movies yet, but listen. We got him squared up. Absolutely beautiful. So you got to love Matty Mac. I'm sure he's watching right now, and he saw himself, and he got really excited. So, so, so look at how he addresses his people in the middle of it. So Paul is addressing his people, and he reminds them of identity. And he said, this is your new heart. He says, look how he, he identifies us as chosen people, holy and dearly loved. And he talks about kindness. This is where you loan people your strength or ability. And he talks about humility, and, and humility is simply seeing myself as I really am in relationship with others and to God. Humility allows me to approach you as a peer, no matter what I have or what you have. He talks about gentleness, and gentleness is my relationship with you, and more importantly, um, the gentleness is my relationship with you, and it's more important than you being impressed by me. Gentle people gear down to the level of the people that they're talking to. And patience is deciding to go to the speed of another person. Then Paul, he brings it back to Jesus. And he says, bear with each other. And, for, and I'm going to teach this text next week. And forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, if you begin to think about this, we all have forgiveness issues. We all have been hurt by someone. And so he talks about this. And then he says this, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these things, virtue, over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of, body, of one body, um, you were called to peace. And then he says, and be thankful. So he adds forgiveness and love and thankfulness to this whole thing. And this is the heavenly things that we look at. And then you think, man, how can I actually do this? Well, you can't do it in your own strength. Paul didn't do this to make a point. He, he said this to make a difference. And he said, if you point to Jesus, if you look at Jesus, if you walk with the Lord, you're going to slowly be like him. And you're going to see that these things really do make a difference. And so here's what he writes in Philippians 3.12. And let's read this one together. He said, not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. And he said, I'm just pressing in. I'm pressing in with Jesus. I'll close with this. D.L. Moody told the story of his conversion this way. He said, when I was in Boston, I used to attend a Sunday school class. And one day I recollect my teacher came around behind the counter of the shop I was at work in. And he put his hand up on my shoulder and he talked to me about Christ and he talked to me about my soul. And he said, I, have not felt, I, I had not felt that I had a soul until then. He said, I said to myself, this is a very strange thing. Here's a man who never saw me until recently, and he's, re he's weeping over my sins, and I never shed a tear about them. But I understand it now. And I know that it is, uh, he, he says, I know what it is to have a passion for people's souls and to weep over their sins. I don't remember what he said, but I can still feel the power of that man's hand on my shoulder. The concern of, and tears of a godly teacher resulted in the conversion of a man who saw a million souls saved in his evangelistic campaigns. It's simply because the first person walked with Jesus enough to care about the second person. Let's bow our heads and let's pray.
God, thank you. Um, thank you this morning for your word. And thank you that you tell us who we are and then you tell us what to do. And Lord, some of these things that we look at are overwhelming and we cannot do them in our own. The Christian faith is supernatural and you're a supernatural God. You, you defeated death. You defeated the grave and you, you rose again and you walk with us and you live in us. And if you're here this morning, you're watching online, you've never taken this step to ask Jesus in your heart. It's very simple. Just say, Jesus, I repent. I know I'm a sinner. I need your grace. I need your forgiveness. I need your mercy. Come and live in my heart. It's in Jesus' name I pray. And everyone said, Amen. Have you guys stand? We'll close together in worship.